So do you wear, are you wearing a microphone? Nope. Okay, well, let me introduce you to these fabulous people. Good morning, my favorite Carverholics. This is Henry with Henry's Bread Kitchen. And today we've got a very special guest. And if you don't know that by now, then you haven't been on Facebook. Anna Giver. I'm not saying that right. Am I saying <laughs> it right? Got go. Say it again, Anna. Anna. Gabur. Gabur. Yes. Anna, I have been following for um, as, as early as I can, as early as she's been on, on YouTube and on Facebook. She is an impressive woman, and she is one of the leaders in um, bread scoring anywhere in the world. I mean, I have seen beautiful jobs done and half jobs done. But nothing ever like what she does. So let me let her tell you a little bit about her. Go ahead, Anna. Anna. <laughs> yes. Um, hello, everyone. I'm really excited to be here. Um, like Henry said, my name's Anna. I am originally from Moldova, where I started baking sourdough bread about four years ago. And I moved to the United States about two years ago to pursue a PhD degree in sociology in Indiana. But I still find time to bake bread because I feel like life is not the same without a loaf of bread in your kitchen. Right. And um, I haven't actually bought a loaf of bread since I baked my first. Um, I love baking bread, but more than that, I love scoring bread, which I feel is uh, my passion and my creative outlet. I came up with my own scoring method and precisely using thread to outline um, the lines on the loaf. And I was inspired by a traditional dish that is traditionally Romanian and that we eat in Moldova, which is a type of polenta, it's called mamaliga, and it's cut with thread. So having grown up seeing that process, um, once I wanted to make symmetric lines on my bread, um, it just came naturally to, to use that method and it worked well. I've been baking, like I said, for four years and I bake, now I bake once or twice a week. There was a time when I would bake every other day. I was so obsessed with it. And uh, of course, a lot of people ask me, what do I do with all of this bread? And if we manage to eat it, um, I happily gift it to my friends, to my colleagues. I bring it to my department so that a lot of people around me get to eat the bread that I bake and I don't manage to eat. It's easy to be, it's easy to be popular when you're a baker. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes. No, nobody minds you sharing bread with them. So you have um, a website called Bread Journey. Yes. Tell me about Bread Journey. So the reason I started the website to begin with was because I was getting questions on Instagram. Mm -hmm. And I noticed that I keep getting the same sort of questions. And I, would, I wanted to have a place that I can share with people. Uh, where they can find answers to those questions. But I wasn't really sure what my website would be about because there are so many great resources online and so many great bakers sharing their recipes. And I didn't feel like that was my forte, just coming up with bread recipes because I had a favorite one that I used for years without changes. Um, so I just thought that, well, it's not really about creating recipes for bread. It's more about my journey learning what real bread is, what good bread is, um, and the joy that it brings me. So that's how I came up with Bread Journey. That's a, it, and it's, it's, it, it's a journey for each of us who decide to go down this road, um, understanding dough. And, and I tell people all the time that, you know, recipes are like, training wheels and you have to you have to use them but when you get to the point where you can rely on how the dough feels how the dough looks how it responds to stretching um, what it smells like then you are in the realm of exploration and that's when it's so rewarding 
yeah, and another important part was because my first years of baking bread were in Moldova, we don't mm -hmm. have bread flour in Moldova. No. So <laughs> I would bake with all-purpose flours for my first years. And so naturally, the recipes that I would find online would just not work because um, the hydration was a bit too high for the kind of flour that I had. Um, I had to develop my own feel, and I was so frustrated that my dough never looked like other people dough did on Instagram or on YouTube because, of course, I was working with a different kind of flour. And so at some point, I just had to throw all that out the window and just learn myself what the dough feels like and what kind of dough results in good bread. That's exactly right. And, you know, what, what starts, I think, where the foundation is laid is in your sourdough starter. Yes. And, you know, one of the things I tell young bakers or brand new bakers is um, a rye start, you know, using some rye flour in your sourdough starter is like having kindling in your fire. It's going to burn quicker. It's just going to burn quickly. So you have to have a little experience to um, understand how to handle a a, a rye flour starter and you you prefer rye flour right yeah that's actually the only starter that i've got and it's the same starter i brought it to the u.s dried up on a wooden spoon because i can't bring actual starter so it was right. dried up on a wooden spoon and i revived it from that and it worked perfectly um and i i do find the rye starter a little bit different to work with because um you feed it in the different proportions, you need a very small amount of actual starter for the feeding. But the reason that I chose it, first of all, the flour that we had at home, like I said, all purpose flour, the starter would have just been starving on that flour and I would have to feed it a lot more often. But right. also, right starter is very versatile. Um, if I want to make white bread, converting the right starter into white starter takes no time. But if I only had white starter and I want to make rye bread, that would have been a whole different story. Yes. So that's why I prefer working with it. It has never let me down. It's survived, uh, move across the ocean. It survived all these years. And um, I'm very happy with it. And it, and it adds some unique flavor to your yes. sourdough. That's that right. You can't get otherwise. That's right. But also some people are afraid that it might give a sour taste, which I haven't noticed that it's more sour than regular sourdough would be like. Because once again, you only need a small amount of dry starter when you're making a white starter for your bread. Um, so it it's interesting that the flavor carries, but it's not it's not too sour. So I think that more people should try experimenting with rice starter and i think they're going to love it as much as i do yeah it's a beautiful thing but a rice starter i've noticed that i've gotten um a sour taste from a starter from a rice starter because it, it's a it's it requires more tension and yes. if it falls and the lactic acid bacteria start dominating over the yeast then you're going to get lactic acid then that's the buildup that causes you to have that sour taste. But I've had it also done right. Somebody, not me, doing it the proper way. And it's the most beautiful thing. When I feed it, for example, for a white loaf, when I make a white loaf, the starter, I feed it in proportion of one to seven to seven. Really? So just a, a little bit of rice starter goes a long way. And it's interesting how like, it's strong enough but the sour taste is really, really subtle because there's just, the proportion is different. There's little starter in the mix. So that, le that leads us to um, maybe some, um, another important aspect to bread development. And that is what we're missing in today's uh, grocery stores is fermentation. Yes. Tell me yes. your thoughts on fermentation. Oh, fermentation is a beautiful thing. Not only because it brings to the bread the taste and the texture that you'll never find in a grocery store, but also for scoring, because there's something that people ask me a lot, like, what kind of flour should I use? What kind of hydration should I use? So a lot of questions of how to make your bread 
really fit for scoring? And my answer is always that you can use all sorts of flowers and all sorts of hydration levels as long as you ferment the bread properly. As soon as I dig my blade into the loaf, I can tell whether it's been fermented to the point under that or over that. And you really need perfectly fermented bread for, uh, for scoring. And I prefer overnight proof. Cold? That ex- Sorry? A, yes. cold? a cold overnight proof in my fridge uh, because that allows me to make sure that I'm not going over with the fermentation. But also I really like the the taste and the flavors right. that that brings. And so if there's anything that I've been really tweaking over the years, it's been fermentation. I'm now a lot more careful with the temperatures that I proof my bread at, um, with the times. And I find that if there's anything that you can do to improve scoring besides practice, of course, right. um, it's paying really close attention to fermentation. Well, I am going to admit something. Yeah, I've baked a lot of sourdough in my day. And when you go on the internet and you look for a sourdough recipe, you're, you're bombarded with easiest sourdough recipe ever, fastest sourdough recipe ever. Well, that's what we're trying to get away from is, is, is all that quick fastness because that's, that doesn't give us a chance to um, ferment our bread properly. But another aspect of the bread that I picked up a few years ago that I, I realized how much of a difference it made is the auto lease. Yes. Now, you had us making, in your, in, in Anna's master class recipe that's associated with this post, and it's a master class if you actually go ahead and find your own wheat berries. <laughs> um, it's something I, it's, a, it's, it's, it's the most challenging sourdough recipe I've ever worked with. Oh, but wow. it was the most delicious because it takes that time. Yes. So tell me about what, the, what how, how auto lease works and why is that so important? Yes, I think, first of all, that um, quick recipes have their place, too. I do have one beginner sourdough recipe that is a lot easier for people who might want to give it a try if they feel that this one is pretty challenging because I think that it's a nice way to invite people in to the sourdough world but you're right once you're there it's not <clears throat> it's not the quick that you're looking for because quick is at the supermarket you want yes, flavor and you want good um and yes i found that autolys well first of all autolys is something that is still in a way disputed in the bread world some people say that you don't need it at all some people advocate for a 15 minute autolys and I will have to say that I started with autolys of 20 to 30 minutes. Now, some people here um, are, are new and they don't know what an autolys okay. is. They have yeah. no idea what we're talking about. So the autolys is the stage where you just mix flour and water. You don't add starter, you don't add salt, and you don't do anything with, with that mixture. You just let it sit and develop its own gluten. And so some people say that Uh, If you're working with bread flour, it's already strong enough and you don't need to help your flour develop gluten. It will just do it. Um, That's their opinion. I started with what's considered conventional time for an autolyse, which is half an hour is what you see in a lot of recipes. I started that back in Moldova. And once again, going back to the fact that I was working with all purpose flour where gluten is pretty weak and 12% there, maybe, maybe. Yeah. And so there was when I discovered that actually autolys plays a huge role. Once I just didn't have um, enough time consecutively to just start my bread and keep at it. So I had to mix it for autolys and leave for a time. And when I got back after two hours, I was just Shocked. absolutely blown away by the strength of the dough at that point. Um, And so I've been slowly pushing the time of my autolys. And I do believe that there is a limit to that too. I don't think that if you try and autolys your flour and water for six hours, you're going to get some benefits. You passed the point of 
total you'll start, hydration at you that will point. start making a starter at that time. You will start fermenting on That's your own, probably. Uh, but when I was in Chicago baking with Christian of foolproof baking, I saw I know Christian. Yes, she, she's a wonderful baker, and she does a three-hour-long auto lease, which was longer than I was doing at that time. And I thought, hmm, let me try and do that, too, and see how it works. And it makes a world of difference, because another question people often have is, why does their bread spread out so much? And there's not an easy yeah. answer to that. There's a few things that can help your bread stay tighter such as shaping, for example, sometimes it's the size of the loaf, the temperature of your kitchen, but also the auto lease time because that brings additional strength to your dough and it helps it stay together. Well, guys, if you um, still are confused a little bit about what an auto lease is, just Google it and, and you'll get pretty simple explanations for what it is. It's and my it's favorite. no work on your part. It's my favorite part of the dough making process because you really don't have to do anything. You just mix flour and water and let it sit there for a while. Yes. So let's get to why people have gathered to see you. Um, let's learn some of your secrets on how to score some bread. Yes. I've got so, some. I've got, I've got two bowls that I made last night so I can try and follow along a little bit but don't wait on me just <laughs> do your thing well so before we even start that uh what people might be wondering what kind of bread is fit to score there are the very few requirements you can score almost any sort of bread i've seen people score gluten-free bread with my designs and it worked well i've scored 100 percent whole wheat loaves and it worked well. It's different results, of course, because the right. craft is different. But if there's anything that is a must, first of all, it's fermentation to the proper point, but also it's cold dough. So that's another reason why our loaves are in the fridge, yours and mine, because that's absolutely necessary. If you like a recipe where you don't have to do a cold proof, um, you can just put your bread in the freezer for half an hour so that it before gets... Before you score it. Yes, before you score it. And I score it right out of the fridge. Um, I'm also often asked whether I let it come to room temperature. That just defeats the purpose. You need it right. cold. Right. You need it tight and you need it to be a little sleepy yeah. so that it doesn't start to open up on you too quickly as you're yeah. scoring it. That's right. That's right. All right. Well... Okay, so I'm going to change now the camera position so you can see everything that I'm doing, and I'll walk you through the process. And I'm going to grab my uh, two loaves out of the fridge. I'm ready when you are. Okay, I, okay, there's signals coming back. All right, go ahead. Okay, so first of all, I have a piece of parchment paper because you need that to slide the dough into the oven. Here's my loaf over here in the lined Benetton. And I just flip it over. I like lining like this because it's easier to peel off than to take it from the Benetton. And if it sticks, all you need to do is spray it with water and it comes right off. Right. Wait, okay. say that again? If, if, if this sticks anywhere to the dough, you spray that little spot with water and it peels right off. Okay. Okay, I got my flour. And I sprinkle a lot of it. After I, this. I've done the same thing, but I've got a banneton that has the 
liner built in. Uh huh. You can take it off. It's the exact, exact same thing that you're doing. Yes, that's right. And then I gently massage the flower into the loaf. And this is where you get to feel the first time you feel it after you put all that work into it and had it sitting working overnight proofing. Yep. Notice what he, notice what it feels like. And that's another reason why I like lining the Benetton. It's the dough really develops a thicker skin because the lining absorbs some of the moisture and so that's you right. get a better skin to work with. That's right. Okay. So now, now a lot of people worry about the flour, all this flour that's left over. Don't worry flour. about it. In my case, I just slide it like this. I see that Henry has the fancy brush to scrub it off, which is it's wonderful. Right. I just go the lazy route. I slide it like this into the oven. It it doesn't actually burn at the temperature that I have it, so it just comes off with the parchment when I take it off. Right. I'm just trying to be fancy. Yes. Good. Good on you. So now what I have here is the very first spool of thread that I started working with. I brought that also from Moldova and this has been used for every loaf of bread that I've made. It's just regular cotton thread. You can use any other kind that you like. And uh, when you press it onto the dough, some people think that it has to cut through the skin. It doesn't. All it needs to do is just leave a mark on the flower. So you kind of have it taut between your thumbs and you place a line that would divide your loaf in half and just move it a little bit so that it leaves a line there. So what if we don't have any baker's twine? What do you use? Um, like I said, this is sewing thread. If you don't have that, I know that people can also use um, unscented uh, dental floss, but that will leave a thicker line. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, just go to uh, any craft store and get any thread that they've got. It will work just fine. Okay. After the first line, you place another one perpendicular to it so that you divide your loaf into four parts. And after that, every time that you place a line, the best way to see if you're putting it right or wrong is to look right here at the angle. Because if you look whether or not you're dividing this part in half, it's harder to tell because there's more dough there and you might not notice the difference. But if exactly. you look here, you will see whether you're dividing the angle in half or not. Good point. There you go. And then you do the same once more here. If you are nervous working with the thread, you might as well start scoring at this stage. It will be less symmetrical. It will be maybe trickier, but it's a good place to start. Um, what I do is I keep going and once again, looking at the angles. Oh gosh, you're going fancy. That's not even, we're not even there yet. Well, I tell you, um, when I first started scoring bread, I would try to copy what other people did. And, you know, some with more success than others. But I found that when you, when you get the fundamentals down and you um, start working with what comes out of your head, it's better. It's, it's a, the, the art comes out better and you feel more satisfied. But you've got to be willing to take the risk and go. At the same time, um, no matter what you do to it, you will still have bread that's good to eat at the end of the day. That's and great. I like to take the Bob Ross approach where 
there are no mistakes, just happy little accidents. Like so that. if, for example, you've misplaced a line and you want to change it, it's easy to do by just rubbing along it with your finger, using it as an eraser, and you can place it again. Okay. So what I'm doing, I'm actually dividing all of those in half one more time. There we go. Like I said, you can use as many or as few lines as you feel comfortable with. The more minute the scoring, the more lines will be helpful to you. That's as far as I'm going. Okay, good. So, next up we need a blade. Yeah. Oh. Yes. This is my favorite tool for bread scoring. Um, you don't actually need a tool. You can just hold the blade in your hand. But it, I know that it can get dangerous for some people. They might nick their fingers. And in that case, you might want to get a lump. Um, I find that this shape is the best for scoring bread the way I do because I can get really close and personal as opposed to a blade that just mounted on a longer stick. That's true. Um, and that's yeah. the one thing I've noticed is the shorter the long, the better. And, and it, this might be a good point to, to show people this one hack. If you don't have all this equipment right away and you've got some razors or you can get some razors at the dollar store. Yes. Take, and take a set of tooth, take a toothpick, uh, not a toothpick, but a chopstick and go in here at the bottom. Now some of these you might have to, to shave down a little bit. You go in at the bottom and come out at the top. Yeah, this one needs to be shaved down a little bit, but you see what I'm talking about. Yeah. So you, you can work your way up to a full baker's uh, arsenal because I obviously didn't, I didn't have Benetons when I started. I didn't even have scales when I started. So, yeah, right. you, you work with what you have, but then keep an eye for the tool that will make it easier for you. Right. Okay, now, you see that the loaf has spread already because we keep, we keep talking, and it's fine. So don't worry about the loaf spreading too much. Um, it might be trickier if you're baking in a Dutch oven, and the Dutch oven is small, and then you have to kind of bunch up your loaf like this then your design might suffer. Um, you might want to do one of the three things. Score more simple designs and do it faster so that the loaf doesn't spread. Try to work with a baking steel or a baking stone or get a larger Dutch oven. Yeah, a lot, I've got a six quart. I love it. Nice. Okay, let's dig in. The blade needs to be brand new. I use every blade four times exactly, one corner per loaf. That is one of the most basic mistakes that people make, but also one of the most dramatic ones is using a blade that you've used who knows how many times. You need a new one and a sharp one so that when you cut into the skin, the line is nice and crisp. Right. So here goes the first line. And by the way, this is not a design that I know ahead of time what I'll be doing. I will just be winging it now. So we will see together what happens. I score something that looks like a wheat stalk. Like this, one line and then three lines on each side. Okay, then I leave the same amount of space that the sweet stock took, I leave the same amount of space as if I, I would skip one and then do another one like this. And you continue doing that all around the loaf. You can really tell the difference in a cold loaf. Oh, yeah, it's... And I, I like the sensation of the blade going into the thicker skin of the loaf that the lining on the Benetton created. You really feel that the dough is not flabby. It's not 
running under your blade. It's not sticking to the blade. The cuts are crisp and clear. I just noticed that I've been making two cuts instead of three for my other stops. So I'll just add them back. Also notice how I am not making the lines like this. You try to have them as tight as possible because they will open up as the dough spreads and as it opens up in the oven. This is, this is cathartic. <laughs> it's, it's like art therapy for me. And it takes courage. There's a difference between bravery and courage. Just, just, it's, it's a piece of bread, folks. Just do it. It's still going to be great at the end. And it'll That's be prettier right. than the last one. That's right. Okay, so here we are with this. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to cut longer lines outlining every wheat stalk and as you see i'm moving my blade back and forth a little bit because if you just pull it like this it will snag and pull the dough so little sawing motions like this like a pedal and don't worry if the line comes clean from the first time there are points where the dough still holds, like you see here. Uh, we will get into those later and release the dough. Now our aim is to just go around in a faster pace and do this to every wheat stalk before they spread too much and the dough gets very soft at the edges. Yeah, this is a beautiful pattern. I think that whatever you try to score on your loaf, even if you start with just a wheat stock because you're feeling nervous about scoring, um, you will still enjoy the result. And even if something goes off and it cracks somewhere or, um, I don't know, maybe the pattern isn't quite as you imagined it would be, it's still a delight for the eyes. And the more you do this, the more you will feel brave enough to try something more sophisticated. So don't feel intimidated by this, that that's what you need to do from the first time to have a beautiful loaf. Okay, here we are at our flower. I noticed that I wasn't quite even with the cuts. Like you see here, the cuts are a little bit closer. Here I have more space. So in order to even that out, I will add another round of lines around these petals. So I will do this. If you see, there's like a second, a second edge to the petal. And like I said, this is a pattern we're discovering together now. And that's good practice for if you just want to score your bread, not by following somebody else's example, but by just seeing how your dough behaves and what your heart desires on that particular day. That's this where experience comes in because you can begin to see as I'm scoring it, I have an, an idea of what the oven's going to do to it. That's right. Okay. So now we still have some space around the edges. Um, what I'm going to do with it is I'm going to add another layer of petals, but not outlining these, but kind of in between, like this. 
I start from the corners of the previous petals. Oh yeah. And just join them in the middle. And here at the edges, you see, I'm no longer doing the sewing motions. I'm just sliding the blade for two reasons. First of all, these are shorter cuts, so it, they're easier to make. But also the edges are not going to be as clearly visible when you bake the loaf. So don't worry too much about them. And in these petals, I will also add some wheat stalks. How big is your loaf? What, what, how many grams do you think that is? Um, so for this loaf, I had 300 grams of water and 400 grams of flour. So it's a 400 gram of flour loaf that amounts, I think, up to like eight to 900 grams. Yeah, mine's about 850. Yeah, so I think that we have the same. And the reason that I can't say for certain is because this is um, half of what I made. I made two loaves and um, I didn't use scales to divide them. So one might have ended up larger than the other. When you're working with dough is at, at this hydration, 85%, it's, um, you know, that, that becomes more difficult. Yeah. So now at this stage, when the dough has spread out, you see points where it didn't, where the, the dough still holds together. And you don't want that because that's going to skew your pattern in the oven. So what I will do now is I will go over these spots one more time with my blade and open them up. How's your loaf looking, Henry? I don't have as much room as you. I'm done. I'm going to pop this in the oven and see if we don't have something colorful to look at at some point. I'm going to put mine in the oven as well. In just a moment. I bake my loaves for 20 minutes at 440 degrees Fahrenheit with steam. And then I... And this, the way I create steam is with a pan of boiling water in the oven. Right. And then half an hour without steam at 420 degrees. So the first half is with the steam. That's right. That allows you, the crust to uh, be a little pliable during the oven spray. That's right. You don't want it to kind of harden immediately and crack. You want right. it to be able to expand. And you probably see now by the way the cuts have opened that the dough has spread quite a bit. Like it used to be this tight. Um, if your Dutch oven is big enough and or if you're baking on the steel or a stone, there's really nothing to worry about. It will spring back up in the oven. I'll go put it in the oven now. These are my smaller Dutch ovens. And when I say it's 500 degrees in here, this is hot, 500 degrees, okay? So one of the things I do, a lot of people you'll see them dumping their bread directly into a, a pot or a, a, you know, one that has like a frying pan on the bottom and the top of the peanut on the top. I'm just scared, too scared of this heat. I shouldn't be reaching over it like this. So I'll grab it by the parchment paper and sit it in there. No mistakes. All right. 20 minutes. 20 minutes. All right. Now what do we do? Have you got another loaf there? Uh, nope. And like, that's the thing. I never score two loaves at the same time. 
uh, I mean, one after the other, because I have a small oven and I can only bake one loaf at a time. Well, you know what? It's, at least it's not as small as some of the ones I see in Great Britain. The ones in England are tiny. You think I can get a spiral out of this? Probably I think not. I think that you know your your bread is your oyster, so you do whatever your heart desires with it. I'll do something that's easy that everybody can just kind of see that it's, it's simple. I'm just making sure that the corners aren't sticking. Voila. This one I didn't use a a cloth in, in the banneton, so you still get to see the rings on it if you want, if that's something you like. It's just wow. And it's a little what catawampus. <laughs> that's what the term term is. So why don't we do this? That looks like a nice loaf. The, bl the blade glides right in. And that's it. That, that one's done. It looks perfect. Well, we'll see. I like the way it feels. So 20 minutes with the top on, then we're going to go uh, take the top off, reduce the heat. Is that right? That's right. And then back in the oven for another 20 minutes. What happens during that last 20 minutes? Why are you taking the top off? So the reason that we don't want any more steam for the second half is because at first we needed that so that the the crust stays soft and expands, but then at the end, you don't want your crust to be soft and gummy. You want it to start to harden and also to get this deep, beautiful color um, that just makes the bread so appetizing. So when you remove the steam, that's when the crust starts to to dry up a little bit. Right. And you get that crunchy crust that caramelized beautiful dark colored crust and you know in the, in the south we we're, we're, we have this thing so if you say sour that means bad ah. so it's a it's a thing that we've grown up with so when you say sourdough in the south initially for people who haven't experienced it someplace else because it's not indigenous here or it is, but it's not, you know, as popular as it otherwise would be in San Francisco and New York and, and Chicago, L.A. So we have to overcome the sour in our bread. So one of the ways we've done it is by explaining why ours is Southern sourdough as opposed to just sourdough because we, the bacteria in the, in the yeast relationship. Um, the other thing is, you know, b dark bread. Dark, you know how tartine bread looks? It's almost black. Yep. And that is something that Southerners are having, having to get used to. And when they when they see that, they don't, you know, I don't, they don't need to think burned, or I don't want my customers to think burnt. This is burnt bread. It's bread that is caramelized, and that's where your flavor is. Yes. And that's where that crust and crunch come from. So you can have a blonde loaf if you want. It'll be two hundred degrees inside and. A beautiful loaf to eat, but let me put one in there and darken it up for you. Yes, that's right. So where, if I want to find out more, learn more about scoring, how to score bread, where can I go to, to get like the full course? So you have a few options. Um, okay. If you want to get just inspiration for new patterns, if you're at that stage, 
you can follow me on Instagram where I'm Brad Journey, and then you just see all my latest loaves. If you need something more than just that, I have a website that is breadjourney.com and a YouTube channel that is also Bread Journey. So easy to remember, same name everywhere. Yes. Um, on, on the YouTube channel, I have full length videos that are very similar to what we did now, where I show different patterns and I explain step by step what's going on there. Um, on my website, I have tips and tricks and I also have what used to be a paid scoring course available for free now for everyone to follow along with how to learn to score bread on your own without needing somebody else's pattern. So basically that. everything that I know about scoring bread and everything that I discovered along my bread journey is out there on my YouTube channel and on my website for everybody to make use of. And it's beautifully done. So, so you get on this website and, you know, the information is easy to come by. It's easy to find. You're not hunting and pecking. And the YouTube channel, I'm visual. So if I watch her do it, I can get closer to that than if I, you know, am looking at it in a blog. But your, 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 your website is more of a blog than a website. That's Isn't right. Uh, that's right, because when I started the blog slash website, like I said, I didn't have an actual um, goal in mind. I didn't think that, okay, this is where I will be posting this kind of information. That's where I'll be posting that kind of information. It was more of, if you will, a diary for me of right. how, I, how I discover bread, how I discover scoring, my relationship with my rice starter. Um, so that's also the tone that I take on my blog as well is I feel that I'm taking you along with me on my journey more than just giving you information and letting you figure it out. Right. You're, um, and, and, you know, it's, it's, it's the exact same philosophy I have is that this is a journey. I heard somebody the other day say that, um, you know, I'm still an amateur. I'm still learning. And I thought, well, we're all amateurs then yes. because you learn something every time you put your hands in dough. Yes. And it's not uh, the recipe, it's the technique that will make the biggest difference in your bread baking. And exactly. You're going to have some failures. If you don't have a bunch of failures, you're not going to have any success in this business in making real good bread. The way I think about bread technique and recipes is like I think about making tea. You don't need somebody... Uh, to tell you that you have to use that many grams of tea leaves, that many grams of sugar, that much right. water at that temperature. Once you just learn of what it is to make tea, you can make every kind of tea out there. Right. As long as you get the training wheels on yeah. and, you have, and you get the bike underneath you, then you can take it off a little bit. But you can't ride it unless you have the wheels on. I see a question there. If we ever use... A curved blade in scoring. Um, I I never use curved blade when I score like this because I need my cuts to be crisp, straight, and precise. Um, I did try my hand at a curved blade when I just, the very few times in my bread baking experience when I just make a slash and throw the bread into the oven because um, I was curious about that and uh, yes, I use the curved blade then, but not when I do artistic scoring. I use a curved blade because that's all I know how to use. <laughs> and I, start, I started out on one, and I, I, I never went any place else. But when you see our loaves, I'm, I'm going to take pictures of ours and post it here, and yes. you'll post yours. And when you see mine come out, you'll see little tiny ears on all of the little uh, incisions. And that's because of the curved blade. Yeah. And it's not any better or per prettier, it's actually worse. Hers is actually the prettiest. <laughs> and that's because she's using the straight, br straight blade. But I, I'm scared to hold it. I don't have a UFO blade like hers. I really want one of those. Henry, I'm going to send you one. How about that? Yes. Good. It, it I'm happy about that. Because you can tell I like
my lungs. Thank you so much for being here today. Thank you for inviting me. It was a pleasure. Listen, it's it's not easy that, um, to take this kind of time out of your day for you know people who want to learn something and, and they're looking at you and you're willing to share what you understand and what you know. And that's that's a big heart. And we really do appreciate it. It shows in your brain. Thank you. And like you said, we're all learners. Um, I wouldn't have been where I am if it hadn't been for all the generous baker out there that answered my questions on Instagram, that showcased their work. So I feel lucky to be able to pass that forward. And I'm pretty sure that many of the people who are watching us now, even if they're making their first steps in scoring bread, um, if you keep at it, if you keep practicing, um, you'll be an invited guest in Henry's Kitchen teaching others before you know it. That's true. Now, so she, remember, it's Bread Journey on Facebook, on YouTube, on Instagram, and it'll be worth your while. And while you're out there clicking keys, find us on YouTube at Henry's Bread Kitchen, at Henry's Bread Kitchen, or my website, henrysbreadkitchen.com, or our um, Instagram page. Our Instagram page is a little place where we can show off stuff that we typically don't show you. It's, you know, when I'm having dinner and I think a sandwich looks pretty, that might make it into the montage. So thank you guys for being here. Henry's Bread Kitchen and Baking Great Bread at Home are dedicated to you guys and bringing you people like Anna, who is just a, a cherish. I'm so glad to have her as a part of this. We'll see you guys next week, same time, same bat channel. I'm out. Thank you. Goodbye. Bye-bye.